The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Jack Barazzini. Hey, Jack. Hey, Dom. And Thomas Enerho. Hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. How's it going? Very good. Thanks. Uh, before we get started, I want to have a plug another show that's on the uh, StarQuest Network, one that I'm sure... Secrets of Technology listeners will love, and it's called Let's Science, and it features our Australian friends, uh, Caroline Knight, Lindsay Sant, and Lena Sabal, talking about science topics, fun, cool science topics. Very, They do it about uh, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour at most, and they cover they cover space, they cover uh, earth science. There's all kinds of fun things. They had a recent episode on tardigrades in space, and <laughs> they had uh, another one on this new titanosaur dinosaur called uh, uh, Cooper. The, it's discovered in Australia, so you got he's gonna have a cool name, and uh, it's just it's a great show. So if you want to check it out, it's wherever you find your uh, podcast, or go to sqpn.com slash science. But let's talk about uh, our topics for tonight. And our first topic is billionaires in space. <laughs> Not uh, quite tardigrades. That's but, like tardigrades. Yeah, kind of close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the tardigrades are actually cooler than the billionaires, but. <laughs> And of course, this this refers to the fact that uh, Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin, Richard Branson of Virgin Galactic, and Elon Musk is, although he didn't go into space, is got his own space company, SpaceX, uh, are all running these projects. And there's a criticism out there: why we should spend so much money, or they should spend so much money on vanity projects like these, when there's so much need on Earth: homelessness, uh, war, the famine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. I'm going to throw it to you guys because you guys are both huge space fans. What do you think? Jack, let's start with you. What do you think about this criticism uh, of the billionaires in space? I think about it in terms of the same criticisms that were brought up in the 1960s against the government. People had the exact same problems uh, then that people have now with people like Jeff Bezos going into space. And on the one hand, I understand... I understand the issues that people have with billionaires, you know, using tax loopholes and all that stuff to not pay anywhere near their fair share of taxes. And I think that those are legitimate concerns, but I don't think that that is mutually exclusive to them also being able to do projects like this going into space. And one of the things that people have actually brought up, because I live in the Huntsville area um, where the Saturn V and the Apollo program were developed. Rocket and City. Way- yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's a cool place. Come visit. Yes. Um, but one of the main criticisms that people have, and especially in increasing years as we've gotten a, a lot of the the politics now are focused on let's go through things in the past and kind of root out quote unquote problematic things. A lot of the guys who worked on the Apollo program were ex Nazi scientists, and that is a that's a it's a complicated issue. It's not a black and white issue because a lot of these guys they were just scientists working for their government and. As with most things, they were just caught up in the machinations of what was going on. There are definitely criticisms for how they could have handled things, but at the same time, you can't know in the moment what's going on. And one of the problems that I have with people saying, well, we need to remove everything to do with Werner von Braun and why did we use any of his research is the fact that that research was there and he was a good rocket scientist regardless of his politics. And to not utilize that, especially at the time when if we did not use it, the Soviets were going to use it. It really seems short-sighted to the fact that that stuff is there and we need to be cognizant of the issues with it, but we also don't need to just stop using something just because some of the people involved with it were less than savory. And I feel like it's the same kind of thing here. And to be clear with Von Braun, he there was no accusations that he committed any war crimes or or crimes against humanity. Right. You know, he he like any other scientist for any, working for any other government military was building weapons for his government. But you know, we had guys doing that too. It's just his government was a bad government. But you know, so and it is a complicated discussion. 
but I think your point relative to this is a good one, which is, you know, the, there are there are many. It, it's it's rarely black and white. It's rarely simple. You know, X or Y. Uh, you know, there's like that like that great meme of the little girl. Why not both? Like, yeah, they these guys are do, like, for instance, Jeff Bezos and and Branson. They do huge charity things. They do run giant companies that employ lots of people and bring economic you know well being to people. You know, it's not one or the other. Well, and, and these are companies themselves, right? So you have, you know, with Bezos, right. it's a, mm -hmm. it's an entire company that he's that he started with Branson. Same thing; it's an entire company that he started based around these spaces. So, uh, and that's that's one of the things that my wife and I would uh, talked about is like we'd like to know what what their work condition for their employees in these companies is because that's one of the one of the criticisms that I think is valid against SpaceX is that their work conditions tend to be a little brutal. And people are there because they want to be, which which I get, but they also are not being paid commensurate to what they could be uh, in an equal field somewhere else. So that, that's one knock against SpaceX. But you know, I, I'd like to know what Blue Origins and, and Virgin Galactic's situation are. But but on top of that, I mean, we're talking about Blue Origins like ten billion dollars, right? It's a ten billion dollar company, and I, or this this rocket launch, I think, uh, leading up to this rocket launch was ten billion dollars. That's chump change to a, a billionaire like you know, to the richest man in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I'm not saying that it's, it's chump change to all of us, but he could be spending that on a house, you know, or on, a, on, a, on an island that's just for complete vanity's sake his, right? And he didn't. Instead, he chose to do something exploratory, something that's, that pushes the boundaries of what's possible. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into talking about, you know, the particulars of the different... Uh, uh, designs that they've gone through for their for their rockets but you know they they're making new technology accessible and that's not wasted money it, it, yeah it might not be returning right now and it might not be putting you know food in multiple people's mouths but eventually just like things like zippers and uh you know tang uh you know <laughs> <Velcro>. dehydrated <laughs> stuff yeah, everything that came from the space program and how useful it's been yeah so I, I think that's something to, so you have to weigh that uh, against each other. You know, historically, so many things have started as vanity projects or aimed uh, luxury items for the wealthy. You know, the, the first steam locomotive was, it ran in a, tr in a circular track, like it, it went nowhere, you know, and people were like, what, why are you wasting all this money to create this toy and, you know, giving rides to people? But now trains, <laughs> they carry you know everything everywhere. The first cars were for rich dilettantes. The air travel was originally a luxury for the rich to go places. And now, you know, if your grandma's sick on the other side of the country, you hop into a cattle car and fly there. <laughs> it is terrible uh, experience, you know. And someday, it's gonna be the moon or Mars or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you know, but but it will eventually available for all. And, and these things, these projects by rich people or for rich people eventually made the modern world we live in possible, including advances in agriculture that feed many billions more people than were being fed in the 70s. You know, the, I mean, all these sorts of things have been made possible in part by rich people putting their money into speculative, uh, you know, and, 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 Let's be honest, uh, ego building project. Thomas Edison was famously uh, egocentric, but he did a lot of good. And it just seems like I think that one valid criticism, and I'm trying to kind of play devil's advocate here on mm -hmm. from what people are saying, is that the way it's portrayed is, oh, Jeff Bezos is flying this rocket into space and he's done all this work. And obviously, he is the one who's facilitated this to be done by having the you know, the capital to pay Blue Origin to do this. And it's up the people working there who a lot of the time you're not really going to know their name. And I, I get that criticism, but honestly, that's how it's always been. Like the Great Pyramid at Giza, it's, I think it's named for Khufu. We don't yeah. know the individual workers who worked on it. That's just... Right. Right. Yeah. Steve Jobs I mean, did not did Steve not Jobs, create. Say, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Steve Jobs, that's, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to look very far back. We don't have to look yeah. back to the pyramids just, just recently, right? Right. He didn't make the iPhone. Bunch yeah. of people did, you know, and, and including a lot of people that we never know their names. Yeah, it's but it's always good. There's always a leader. I mean, George Washington didn't fight every battle in the in the War of Independence. He, he but he was the he was the commander in chief. We we don't we never know all the names. So yeah, I I I, I agree with you on that one, Jack. It's it's not really it, just because his name is up front. 
and and these companies aren't don't merely exist for the sake of lifting a billionaire into space. I mean, that's just sort of you know, in 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 one sense, it's like if I'm if I'm the guy who started the company. I kind of want to be the first one to ride on it. Like, <laughs> right, exactly. I, I may never go up again, but, you know, I put the money up. But this company exists for a different reason. Blue Origin exists to lift payloads into orbit for, right. for the government and for private enterprise. I mean, that's just like SpaceX. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting that SpaceX didn't go that way, right? Elon Musk did not put himself in the first capsule to go up. He, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're contracting to carry uh, people into space that were supposed to be going there and um it, it, but it, but it's it's also interesting too that the faa uh, recently changed their definition of what an astronaut is and i think that kind of dovetails into what we're talking about here and so it it looks like what's going to end up happening is that uh jeff bezos will not be an astronaut and uh richard branson sir richard branson will actually be an astronaut according to this definition and so the the two sticking points are that um when you are going into space you have to be doing something that's related to exploration and advancing exploration. And you also have to have been trained to do that particular thing. Okay. So it's not, not just that you, you know, shelled out some money and got yourself out of, out and out past the Carmen line. And so, um, uh, business did not do either of those things. He just went up and he came back down and that, that was it. But Sir Richard Branson is a trained pilot. He made sure that that was something that he did before he went up. And when he was going up, since he was in the cabin, he was technically testing the cabin experience. That was the definition of what he was doing when he was going up. It was written beforehand. They talked about it all during the launch, that that's what, he, what his purpose, the purpose of the, the astronaut sitting in the backseat of the Virgin Galactic system. Uh, they were all testing the cabin experience as they were going up, which means that they were performing an experiment to advance exploration and that he had been previously trained. So he fits the definition then of uh, the FAA's definition of an astronaut. Hmm. That is interesting. And I would say that uh, I think that makes sense because if Jeff Bezos riding in a capsule is an astronaut, then we're all airline pilots under the <laughs> right. same definition. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, does it make a difference, the purpose of the company? Like Blue Origin and SpaceX are about, you know, classic payload lifting into space. Virgin Galactic, they're space tourism. I don't think they've made any bones about the fact that they're not about doing other stuff. Or am I wrong? Are they, do they, they have bigger they plans? Are. Uh, they are actually. I was okay. I was really surprised looking at the list of astronauts that they have coming up. There is not a single launch that they have planned that does not have someone on it who is running a scientific experiment of some kind. Uh, so every single launch that they have, someone is going up with something that benefits from that zero gravity uh, system. So it, it, some of them are pressurized things. Some of them are just um, tests about uh, traveling in space, about uh, you know, low, low orbit travel. Uh, some of them are atmospheric tests. And uh, for anybody who's played uh, Kerbal Space Program, which is <laughs> one of my favorites, um, just doing stupid tests right outside the, the Kármán line, it, it's, it's an important thing, you know, just taking that data that says that there, there is actually a difference between this this way of doing things and this way of doing things so they are actually you know it's not much it, uh, it's a very limited window that you have to run a test so, you, so it has to be something that can be very immediately taken uh measurements of but it's still one of their primary purposes is to get scientists okay. up there mm -hmm. thomas you um you've mentioned a couple times the carmen line can you explain for the listener what that is okay so i'm going to butcher it because i can never remember exactly what it is but the carmen line is 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 basically the spot in space uh, where we have sort of put the arbitrary line and said, okay, this is where Earth ends and space begins. And it's, uh, it, it was established just because there was a lot of discussion about what exactly it meant during the space race, you know, what, what constituted space. Because we could fly aircraft really high, but there was a certain point one, where once an aircraft got high enough, there was no more atmosphere for it to be able to continue to run. But that still wasn't, really space because there was more atmosphere out there. It just w was thin enough that you couldn't fly a plane anymore. So the Carmen line's about 100 miles up. That's, that's the easiest way to remember it. It's 100 miles up. Uh, that is the spot at which you've traveled outside of Earth, and you are then in space. Okay. And mm -hmm. there was some controversy over whether 
uh, well, I think it was Branson actually made it past the Garmin line, right? Uh, I thought that that was there was a controversy about one of them going whether they actually made it past the line and got into space. Oh, I hadn't heard that. Oh, or, interesting. I'll have to look that up. Okay, I, I, I was I remember there was like talk about it and whether I think I thought it was Branson whether he actually was going to be going literally into space, even though they're suborbital and all that other stuff. So I was I was kind of curious on that. So maybe maybe that was didn't. Maybe they both made it past it, and it was not really material afterward. Well, even the Carmen line is like it's it's one of those things. Talking about low orbit, you're still yeah inside of the atmosphere, really. Like yeah, you've not you're, achieved you're still able to be slowed down. Orbital, <laughs> you've not achieved like an orbital trajectory at that point. Like even right. with Blue Origin, like he wasn't staying in orbit with that with that launch. But that wasn't the intent. The only one that's done that so far has been SpaceX. SpaceX, right. I wonder how high Alan Shepard got in his original, because now, now, we're, now we're really into the uh, space trivia. It's, this is how space uh, enthusiasm goes. Uh, I, I wonder if he got higher than the um, than the others did. That's a good question. His trajectory of Alan Shepard's historic flight from NASA. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, I shouldn't open up web pages while I'm uh, doing a podcast because it <laughs> tends to really mess with my uh, link. Uh, it says, oh, wait, 125 miles. There it is. Okay. So, so well above. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, I think, well, the, another aspect of this, too, is that the, of the criticism of this is the criticism of space tourism, like as if, you know, just paying attention. For, like you said, paying for a ticket to get a seat and going into space is somehow not a valid use of space, you know, of uh, use of this technology. Um, and, you know, we, we shouldn't. You know, there's one congressman from Oregon who wants to have a uh, an excise tax on space tourism. Uh, what do you guys think of this? <laughs> Apart from the, uh, the the obvious politics of it. What, what do you think of this this idea of. Space tourism is somehow not a valid use of technology and money and that sort of thing. I think it's just the government trying to get their cut. Yeah, as with the most <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, well, and I feel like I feel like too. What you, all you're going to do is just push all of these space companies to launch stuff off of boats. That's right. That's yeah, that's what they've been wanting to try anyway. But now, that's a good. That's point. what you're going to make them do. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll push them to have spaceports. In either in other countries, who will say, "Hey, come down here to Mexico, or come up here to Canada, or what have you," and launch from here. I mean, isn't that uh, French Guyana in in South America is where the European Space Agency has launched rockets for ages? I mean, they have mm -hmm. the infrastructure down there that could become the spaceport for these private companies. So, yeah, you could be cutting off your nose to spite your face in this case if if <laughs> yeah. they if Congress passes this. I I think. I don't know. There, well, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it, because I, mean, cause I think there's there's some politics involved here about classism and that sort of stuff. Uh, but I don't think it's an invalid invalid for reason for someone to go into space because they just want to go. I if I had two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'd plunk it down on the table to, to go up yeah. in Virgin Galactic. You know, I mean, just. I, don't well, know. I, I mean, put I put my um I put my entries in on uh, Omaze when they when they announced <laughs> yeah. that they're I thought, you know I've got I've got all my entries in there I did I did it <laughs> right right well, right so and, and I think a lot of this um with with arguments about like why are they doing this in the first place it's like sometimes just because we can like the fact mm -hmm. that we have the ingenuity to build machines that can take us into space is really awesome and I feel like that's enough of a reason to go right. There, you just get the feeling that there were people back in 1491 saying to Columbus, look, why are you wasting your time trying to find some <laughs> land across the sea? We've got plenty of things we need to do right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine like if he hadn't got sometimes we go because there's more to see. There's more to do because it's because it's there. You know, and some I, of it, some of it, we need to start rewriting the narrative, too. Right. I, mm -hmm. Because I, I think Star Trek worked to boldly go where no man has gone. Right. To, to right. just explore. Star Trek worked because they were in a society that was um, resource rich, right? They, okay. they were, had an overabundance of things. Yep. Uh, and so there was, there was nothing holding them back. And we're at a spot right now where we are resource rich. We have, uh, yes, there are still problems, right? And, but I think one of the things that you see if you really pay attention to Star Trek is that there were still problems in the Federation, right? The Federation wasn't perfect. There were still 
out groups and there were groups that didn't have and mm -hmm. uh, there were people that needed to be taken care of. So even in a resource rich environment, there's always going to be the poor are always going to be with us, right? Yes. That's that's Jesus always going to be the case. Yes. But that doesn't that doesn't mean we drop everything we're doing. You know, we we do move forward, we explore, we advance and and a lot of times those explorations and those advancements, they can they can make benefit. They can make other things off of off of the side of them, right? Right. And that's what we need to look for is the opportunity to say, first off, we're not so destitute that we can't afford to do this kind of thing because we can, we're doing it. Yeah. It's happening. And it's not, the, the world is not falling apart because uh, a few millionaire, a few billionaires want to go into space and it won't because largely we're okay. And so we need to start moving away from that. Like, well, everybody's, uh, there's horrible things happening and we, you know, yeah, I mean, there are, but that's always going to be the case. Right. Right. That'll always be a reason not to go. Right. And the money that is going into these space programs compared to the global GDP is minuscule. If you really look at the percentage, like $10 billion is obviously an insane amount of money, but it's not that much compared to all the other money in the world. And that amount of money, that additional amount of money is not going to fix these problems that people are concerned right. about. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a pittance compared to the problems. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, to, it, it's, it sounds a lot like the, the criticisms of um, why the Vatican is full of priceless art. Shouldn't the Vatican right. sell, the church should sell off all this priceless artwork? Why are we spending all this money on, on big, beautiful churches? Well, you know, when people are in need. Well, because these are expressions of who we are that God has made us to be. God has made us to be uh, awed by beauty, seekers of truth. You know, wanting justice, uh, seekers of justice, to 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 go out and find, to be curious, and to explore mm -hmm. the creation that He has given us. I mean, we like, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Right. We can take care of the poor and explore space. We can fix our earthly problems and go into space at the same time. These are not exclusive. And the fact is, is these are private individuals. These are just. These, this is not. You know, when the government's doing it, it's, oh, why is the government wasting our money? Well, okay, so the government's not doing this. It's private individuals. Why are these private individuals wasting? Hey, hey it's, <laughs> when it comes down to it, it's their money. Some right. people are never going to be happy, though. <laughs> if yeah. Jeff Bezos piled his millions into a big pile and set them on fire, it's his money. Like, when it comes down to it. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. We don't have a right to tell him what to do with it. Uh, so, I mean, to me, that feels like the bottom line is, you know, we could criticize all we want, but it's really... It's a private enterprise, and it's a private business. It's not illegal. Mm -hmm. I suppose we could, like this Oregon congressman, try to pass right. laws to, to regulate it. But. but when that happens, people stop aspiring to more, and then nothing gets done, and everyone is still miserable, and yes, right. the problems are still going to be here. Like People need something to live for. Right. Something to raise their eyes up. I mean, what, every time one of these launches goes off, people gather around their, their computers. They go on the YouTube live stream. You know, the whole thing, people are, we, we are in, inspired by this. We are excited mm -hmm. by this. Uh, these are things, the, what, one of the few rare things that bring us all together, right. although apparently not. But you know what I mean? <laughs> many more of us anyway, uh, we need more of this sort of thing that unites us than that separates yeah. us. Right. Well, and I'll tell you, watching the watching the Blue Origin launch and landing, I was really worried that Jeff Jeff Bezos had died. I was I was oh, very really? concerned because <laughs> oh, wow. when when he landed, he just sat there. Yeah. And he, like, he yeah. didn't move for the longest time. And I was like, <laughs> oh <okay>? boy, <laughs> someone yeah. go poke Jeff. <laughs> this, is, this is not good. Yeah. <laughs> right. I I suppose if I if I had just gone into space, I would probably right. <laughs> sit there be processing it for a while mm -hmm. for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that's a, a great discussion. We'd love to hear y your feedback on what you think about this topic. And, you know, is, is it a waste of money? Is it something that they should be doing? Or is this, you know, you, I mean, you've heard our opinions, so we, we'd love to hear yours. Uh, and you could always let us know what you think by sending an email to technology at sqpn.com. So before we go on to our next segment, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the Secrets of Technology, including Stephen R., Gary H., Daniel V., Jared C., and Joseph W. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Technology in all the shows at StarQuest 
You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. All right. I have a little unusual little bit of the segment this time. I, before we get to some headlines, I've, I've been collecting these automations that I've been running uh, in my home, like Shortcut. So iOS has these this program called Shortcuts and these little scripting programs, automations uh, that you can build, uh, which are can be really fun and useful. And I had a couple of them. And I told someone about them, like, oh, you should you should talk about them on the show. So I'm going to share a couple of the ones that I've created recently. And uh, these are little automations that make life a little easier around my home. Now, the first one I call is the bathroom available. And let me tell you a little backstory on that. <laughs> I live in a small house, one bathroom, seven people. OK, the bathroom <laughs> is never available. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. so uh, now I have smart lights everywhere in my house. Right. All the all the outlets full, I have the, the smart bulbs, the home kit bulbs. And so what I've done is I built an, a shortcut home automation. So in, in the shortcuts app, there's a section called home automations that when the bathroom light turns off the home pod mini in my office, I have it play a song, play audio, and I've chosen a song. I chose Who Let the Dogs Out, but, you know, you can <laughs> choose anything that you want. Uh, I just felt like that was appropriate. Uh, and so whenever someone, what happens is, is whenever someone turns off the bathroom light, the song plays in the, in my, in the office. Now, obviously, I don't want that to happen every single time one of the seven, six seven, or seven people in my house <laughs> goes to the bathroom. I would quickly go crazy with of who lets the dogs out. So you can and turn it on and off. So like, if I decide, okay, I need to, you know, use the facility and I go and somebody's in there, I'm like, okay, hey, you know, I'd hurry up. And then I turn it on in my phone, turn the automation on, and I go back to the office, keep working. And then who let the dogs out plays? And I'm like, I know I can go. So you can adapt that for anything, really. But it's it's this great little thing where, you know, when something turns on or off, someone does a thing in a room, you could have it when the, someone turns the thermostat above a certain temperature or below a certain temperature. You could It could play, give you a warning or something like that. Um, I'm trying to think of how to um, connect it with the, my ring doorbell so that when someone rings the doorbell, it the flashes light and I get the Star Trek klaxon or something. That would be kind of, you know, <laughs> nice. red alert! Um, or I, I, that probably not. So, so that's one <laughs> of my automations. And the other one I call really do not disturb. So this set of shortcut personal automations, it detects when, whenever I put my phone into do not disturb mode, it sets my office's HomePod mini volume to zero. What I found is, is that, uh, it's connected. The, the HomePod is connected to various things. And so like if someone rings the doorbell, it it'll the the home pod will ring or or other things or someone in, else in the house could cause it to make noise and when I'm recording a podcast that's that's a bad thing. Uh, in fact, if it was enough of my podcast, you probably heard it go off until I fixed it. So now I have it so that when the when the shortcuts the text of the phone is in do not disturb mode, it sets the office home pod to ze volume zero, and then when I turn do not disturb off, it sets it back up to the volume the, the normal volume I like it at. And uh, one of the things I do is you make I make sure that set both those, those are two different shortcuts, and I make sure to set them both to don't ask before running. Uh, you can set shortcuts to say, hey, do you want this to run? You don't want it to do that because if I've already got the phone in do not disturb mode, it's not going to be asking me <laughs> to to do it. So one thing I've I've kind of run into is that uh, when no matter where I am, if I set my phone to do not disturb, it it does set the HomePod to zero, which is not usually a problem because I'm the only one who really uses it. But like when I get in my car and my I turn the car on and the Bluetooth on the car activates, the phone automatically goes to do not disturb while driving, and it sets the. But it it hasn't been a problem, so I I, I don't worry about that. But uh, your mileage may vary. Anyway, those are my fun little shortcuts. I can uh, I think I I can share those. In fact, I might. Yeah, I can put links to them in the show notes. I, there are links I can share, and then you can if you if you are an iOS uh, or Mac user. Because uh, with the new M1 Max, you can uh, you can download this for yourself and take a look at how they work and adapt them to your own use. Nice, that's awesome. So uh, let's move on to talk about some headlines. Uh, our first headline this is just very interesting to me. I saw this and I said we could definitely got to talk about this. This is in our wheelhouse. Facebook, the New York Times had an article: uh, Facebook's next target, the religious experience. 
And the story is about how Facebook is working with religious groups, a, a lot of different ones, uh, Christian, Muslim, uh, uh, Jewish, some uh, Eastern uh, faiths, and including Catholic. Uh, they mentioned Father Robert Barron in the article. Uh, sorry, Bishop Robert Barron. My brain still calls him father. <laughs> um, so the, the, the article says, the company aims to become the virtual home for religious community and wants churches, mosques, synagogues, and others to embed their religious life into its platform from hosting worship services and socializing more casually to soliciting money. It's developing new products, including audio and prayer sharing aimed at faith groups. So what do you guys think of Facebook wanting to really get into the religious business? <laughs> what do you guys think of this? I think that they're picking up on a lot of trends that are going on just naturally, like being able to be more interconnected, which is a great thing. I do not trust Facebook to do it well or safely at all. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Thomas? Yeah, I, well, having been a social media director for a parish, uh, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it, I, it's, a, it's a noble goal, but I think in a lot of cases, um, encouraging your entire community to move that direction is difficult because... I had to do so much retraining for people in our community uh, and how to deal with uh, hecklers and trolls and, and just people that just disagreed and wanted to voice their opinion. Uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a complete mindset shift that uh, a lot of people weren't ready for. And, um, you know, fortunately, we got them through it and we, we made, made things work out. But a lot of it was just, you know, hey, it, you have to choose. Do you want to engage this or do you just want to shut it down? If you shut it down, it doesn't look great. If you engage it, there's a chance that the person has a platform that they wouldn't have had before. So I don't know. It's I, I like the idea of community, you know, of, of us going to spaces that uh, where people are. That's that's really the, the aim of evangelism, right? Is to go to where people are. But at the same time, I have become very disenchanted with the toxicity of social media uh, groups. And so there, there is a limit to where you want to go to where people are. You know, the, the marketplace, maybe, yes. The brothel, probably <laughs> not so much, right? Right. right. <laughs> and I think you see that even, like, if you look at Catholic Twitter, like, it is an absolute cesspool, to put it in nice words. And I feel like it is probably <laughs> one of the greatest barriers to evangelization. Like, if, if you're not Catholic and you go look at the way Catholic people talk to each other on Twitter, it's very disheartening. Right. And I feel like this would just be more of the same. So I've long been – I worked in uh, diocesan social media you know, more than a de you know, over a decade ago. I started doing that. And I was always telling parishes, okay, you know, get involved, have a Facebook page, you know, have your people check into church you know, when they go to events, so you know, set up your events on Facebook. And I still, I still, I'm okay with that. Where I start to get a little itchy is when I, when Facebook wants to partner with and create tools for, and I'm not opposed to giving us better tools for, to, to engage with people in our faith. It's the, I just, I know how Facebook thinks, <laughs> right. you know, and that's the problem. It's like Facebook, when, in this article, when they, when they ask, straight up ask the person from Facebook, what are you going to do with all the data you collect? Oh, we're not going to treat it any differently from any other data we collect from our users. <laughs> that's a, that should be a red yeah, flag. flag <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 and honestly, it's, it's, that's, the, that's the thing that bothers me about Facebook is the reason that Facebook and Twitter are, are the way they are is because their entire design is about engagement. It's about keeping people engaged. And the right. thing that keeps people engaged consistently on these platforms is not positive interactions. Negative. It's negative yeah. interactions. Yes. Right. right. Negative, negativity is what boils the blood, gets people arguing back and forth, and keeps people engaged with stuff like that. You're right. And that's not what any religious group should be aspiring to to have you really don't want an algorithm trying to pick which post is best from your uh, mm -hmm. from your oh, religious yeah. group right <laughs> yes because you it's always going to be that one guy who's you know it in it, it every church meeting is <laughs> in the back always complaining about stuff his post will always go to the top because yeah. he'll get the most negative reaction and i think just with the like facebook censorship rules and 
we know that Facebook's values do not align with the values of a lot of different religious groups, not just Christians. And right. how are they going to decide what they have to police based on those mm-hmm. those rules? That's a good point. You know, at what point do the tenets of our faith conflict with f- Facebook? And then and then where does this partnership go? Right. I, I note that of all the, the religious groups mentioned in here, they, you know, the Presbyterian Church USA, the Church of God in Christ, these very large Protestant denominations, uh, Jewish groups, and, and, and that sort of thing. The only Catholic mentioned is Bishop Robert Barron. There, there is no mention of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops or anything on that scale. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I find that very interesting. And, and, that's, that, and, and to be clear there, uh, the Word on Fire ministry, the, Bishop Barron's ministry, is very good at curating their interactions yeah. and being being careful about what they interact with and how, and they have a thick, thick, thick skin. Yes, they <laughs> so, do. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's important. Yeah, th- I mean, their their whole mission is to be out on the bleeding edge. They're out there, right. you know, not with the. They're not preaching to the choir. They're out there trying to reach the people who are going to be hostile to them. But mm-hmm. yeah, I I think I think the uh, the the tenor of the article and and just my the way I react to it is kind of summed up by the end where they talk to this guy from this mega church Hillsong in Atlanta. And he says uh, he's partnering with Facebook to quote directly impact and help churches navigate and reach the consumer better. And then he corrects himself. A consumer is not the right word. I mean, the parishioner reach the parishioner better. And it's like, <laughs> yes, you see, this is Facebook evangelizing you, infecting you. Like, right. we, you know, the people you're reaching are not consumers. <laughs> Their preach it, Go preach in the marketplace, not the brothel. See, <laughs> exactly. That's, right. that's what it comes back to. <laughs> exactly. All right. So uh, let's keep a wary eye on Facebook's uh, entering into the religious experience. Uh, our next headline is from the, the UK Guardian, and it says, uh, What happened when a wildly irrational algorithm made crucial healthcare decisions? And the, 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 the crux of the article is about how... Uh, a lot of these healthcare systems, whether it's the government, uh, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, or other um, private insurance, they start to apportion healthcare dollars based on these algorithms of who who needs it, and it they they highlight some of these stories of people who are relying on daily care to remain independent. These people have independent lives, they have jobs, but they need someone to care for them on a daily basis. Like, you know, they're, they're disabled in, in different ways. Um, and when this stuff went away, they became housebound and uh, were, they had terrible health outcomes. I don't want to describe some of them, but, you know, they ended up being institutionalized, which is worse for everybody. It's worse for mm-hmm. the person. It's worse for the society. It's worse financially. Um, so what do you guys think? The, 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 the quote from the article that I wanted to pull out was, government officials have touted algorithmic decision-making systems as a way to make sure that benefits are allocated even-handedly, eliminate human bias, and root out fraud. But advocates say having computer programs decide how much help vulnerable people can get is often arbitrary, and in some cases, downright cruel. So what do you guys think of this? I think one of the crucial words there is human bias, and I don't think the word that they should replace human bias with human empathy because yes. a lot of times caring for sick people is not a for-profit business. And I think that's a lot of the issues we're having with just the way healthcare is handled in general. But yeah, from like from an algorithm point of view, this person's costing a lot of money and like, what's that going towards? But from a human point of view, yeah. And that's, that's why we're caring for them. Right. Right. Well, and even without that, the, um... They're, the training that is going into these uh, into these algorithms is very bad, and, and this has been across the board in the medical field, especially. So, if you're looking for a job and you want something that you are, if you're in college and you're looking for a job and you're like, you know, AI is a cool thing. I really do this well. If you mm-hmm. want to do it, yeah, right? you're going to need to write a doctoral thesis about it before you get it done. But but basically, what you need to do is build a set of tools that does not rely solely on statistics that exist, but uh, that has some level of, of empathetic tools built into it. Because the, the problem is, is that we end up with things like, well, okay, the outcomes for this particular uh, race, gender, age combination are abysmal, so we're just not going to allocate funds to that. That's mm-hmm. what the algorithm will say, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the problem is, is that the algorithm is, is just looking at a sheer statistical sheet and making and crunching numbers. That's all they're doing. 
and instead of actually like trying to take a holistic approach, which is what a human would do, a human would sit down and look at it and take a human, uh, you know, a holistic approach and say, oh, well, you know, I think this is good. And I, I get that they're trying to eliminate bias. But the, the problem, the problem there is that you just need to train humans better, not give the, the training right. over to a computer. <laughs> right. It needs like a, like if you've ever played with a MIDI program, uh, when you're putting in like drum beats or different parts, you can, there's like usually a knob that says humanize. And basically that puts in little imperfections in how the music is played. So it sounds more human. These algorithms just need a humanize knob. You can turn <laughs> right. up. So we got to do, we got to figure out the humanize uh, switch. Yeah. <laughs> it all comes back to data. That's it's, it's all. It's all that emotion chip. <laughs> in a way, it's like it's that they don't have enough data. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they like mm -hmm. they have a set, but what they need is all the data. They need all the information. They need to, to and and I, I I take that point that you made about you know we need better um, algorithms. We need better machine learning because what we need to do is build into the machines and a sense of empathy, an empathy mm -hmm. generator. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. in in the sense of that that care human caring love and in, in, in caring for someone uh, because they are good and valuable in and of themselves has to be one of the huge points in it in any algorithm you know i i agree i having to deal with the healthcare system in general for all this my seven member family it, it drives me crazy because of these sorts of things these decisions that are just seem arbitrary and like why like why why would you do that it's much it's much worse outcome for us and in you in the long run the insurance mm -hmm. company than if you just did this or just paid for this or just but you know nope turning the dials and 10,000 people if we do this to 10,000 people for 9,000 people it has the outcome we want or something i am i am reminded of a moment of uh, a a training that i went through a leadership training that i went through and I had, to, I had to recuse myself from the game because I immediately recognized it for what it was. Uh, they were playing this game where it was, um, I can't even remember what they called it, but it was like a, a, it was a, a winning game. It was one of those games where it was like you had to, you had to cheat to win, basically. And um, so immediately I recognized it as the prisoner's dilemma, right? We all get ahead if we all agree and, and do mm -hmm. the right thing. But, uh, and so I was like, you know, I, I can't play because I know, I already know the end. I already know what's going to happen. So I don't want to throw anybody else's decision making process. And watching people play that game in a leadership conference was intense. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. It, because there was so much bickering and backstabbing and awful infighting. And people's feelings were really hurt by the end of the game once you reveal what it is. And it's like, oh, well, you all could have gotten ahead if you had just all been honest. And, and then everybody's like, well, you shouldn't put us in that kind of situation. It's like, well, that's exactly what we... That's <laughs> exactly the point. <laughs> you, should, yeah, that's the, you, should, you should feel that way. You need to... You know, and so some of it, I think, is you know, just building a default switch into some of these algorithms that tends to yes, right? That tends to say yes. yes. If there is no overriding reason why we should say no, yeah, the cost is high. Yes, uh, I, I get it. But that person still needs to be cared for. If there's nothing that, if, if like every single light doesn't tick on to say, no, this is a bad idea, then the answer should be yes. And, mm -hmm. and something as simple as that could really help fix these algorithmic problems that we're having dropping people out of these care systems. That's interesting. It's, it's, yeah, it flips on the head the, 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 with uh, safety systems that unless everything is go, you know, you, you, you don't go. Right. Whereas unless, the, unless everything says no, then, then you do go. Right. I like that. I, I like that idea. Yeah. That there should be a default tendency toward compassion, toward, you know, sure, we might lose a little money, but we're actually, but we are taking care of someone. You know, we're not being as efficient as we could possibly be, but, you know, people are getting taken care of as opposed to, I mean, it's sort of the idea of uh, with the innocent until proven guilty rule where mm -hmm. right. uh, we let, uh, it's better to let 900 men go, guilty men go free than to imprison one innocent man. And it's, it's sort of that idea. We should, we, you know, we should let 900 cases of fraud go through or cases where the person didn't really need the services rather than let one poor uh, disabled person live in squalor and end their right. days in a ho horrific cruelty. I agree with that. I think compassion is kind of inefficient anyway, so we need to yes. understand that. Compassion yeah. should be the default. Yes. All right. Uh, our last headline is uh, a little more c conventional technology headline about Netflix. Netflix is apparently going to start publishing video games. Now, what this means exactly is still, there's been no official announcement, 
so many are speculating that it's going to be more like a streaming cloud service, sort of like Google Stadia or, or uh, Microsoft was X Cloud. Is that what it's called? Something like that. Uh, yeah, they have a. That they sounds have a, great. Yeah. yeah, I think it's X Cloud, uh, as opposed to something that's more like a, a Apple Arcade, where it's not streaming; they're downloading game, downloadable games that you get for one flat fee a month for the whole service, uh, which actually is more like Netflix, <laughs> which people compare it to the Netflix of of mm -hmm. video gaming. But uh, but it's probably more more likely to be a some kind of streaming service. Uh, what do you guys think of this? Of Netflix getting into game publishing. I think that unless they get some really compelling and interesting titles, this is going to go the way that Stadia and there was another one. I cannot remember the name. Um, there was a lot of hype around it. It was three or four years ago. Um, and they had like one of the set top boxes that was like, you know, basically just a terminal. Right. Um, and everyone was really excited about it. And then it came out and it just wasn't that good. Right. I, if anybody could do it, Netflix could do it. That, that's, that's, I, I have, I have yet to see something that I didn't doubt Netflix could do, and then they just proved me wrong. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, <laughs> I'm keeping my 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 mind open about this one. <laughs> uh, the the key is the is the they've got the streaming part. They know how to stream many right. many large uh, files. You know what I mean? Like that whole like when every time a new show comes out and it debuts on a particular day and millions of people are watching it. I have many fewer glitches with Netflix than I ever do with other streaming services like Disney Plus or like every time a new episode of The Bad Batch comes out, I have to fiddle with the app to try to get it to show me the, the latest episode, you know, or, or or that sort of thing. So that that streaming part of it, I I have I would be confident. It's the game part. And I saw in this article from Ars Technica, they mentioned that maybe they'd be building them around like they have created shows and movies around game properties like The Witcher. For instance, mm -hmm. what if they they were doing something similar where they were building games around their already existing vi video properties? So that would be like sort of co-publishing. That's an interesting idea. I mean, they've got some things out there that they could make games from, but... It kind of depends on what they're talking about uh, as a video game, too. Um, I would like to see. This, I, I was thinking about this, and I was like, uh, I don't know if you guys ever played the old um, Dragon's Lair game. Uh, it was an arcade game, yeah. and it was, but it was oh, a movie. Yeah. It was an interactive movie, right? It was like and a so cell, it was a, cell animation. Yeah, yeah. cell animations. Right. And, and then every once in a while, something would flash on the screen, and you had to push a, push a joystick a certain direction or press a button. I would actually like to see something like that. Um, and... I, I think Netflix could really push the envelope with something like that, where you had a an interactive novel, and they've already been moving that direction with some things like like Black Mirror had some Bender episodes Snatch. that were yeah. mm -hmm. were sort of like that. So I'd be interested to see if they push the boundaries of what a video game is, and I think if they did that, that would be the way to make this thing successful. I think it'd be interesting, but. Like you were talking about with the Dragon Slayer game, like once you play that once, you kind of know what to do. It's really just a, you push the right button to get the next sequence, and there's not a lot of interactivity. And obviously, that was due to the limitations of the technology at the time. But I just don't see a lot of hardcore gamers going for something like that. And so, this is going to have to be something that's going to appeal more to casual gamers. Like, I, I feel like this might also be. Or might be more like something like the Telltale games like they did with The Walking Dead yes. and stuff like that, mm -hmm. where it was much more narrative focused than it was gameplay focused. Mm, interesting. You know, the fact that they, the guy that they've hi hired to head this group co is, comes from Oculus, from Facebook's Oculus VR group. Hmm. And I wonder if it might have something to also to do with a VR, uh, a VR hmm. immersive narrative game i mean that would be i mean i think of it a lot like um on oculus the uh vader immortal uh, uh s series that they have there which it's a it's a game it's you're a first person you're in it but it's a story i mean you're in star wars which is kind of awesome mm -hmm. and you know and i could imagine i think we're all in agreement net coming from netflix we're sort of imagining more narrative storytelling mm -hmm. as opposed to more pure gaming um, I, I don't see them doing casual gaming, you know, Angry Birds on Netflix sort of style. Right, right. Um, it just doesn't make any sense coming from them. But the the big problem is it takes years to develop a good game. I mean, it's these are 
mm-hmm. long lead times. Well, but you know, you got TV shows too that that uh, you know really good quality productions do take years That's to true. do. And I think I think really we need to expand what the definition of a video game is. You know, I recommended um, previously on on uh, on our podcast here. I recommended a, a game called Tacoma, and it was a visual novel. It really, it wasn't a video game in the traditional sense, but it would definitely fit this. Like it would, it would be a great game to convert into a live action, uh, on your screen game where you explore the different elements of what what's available inside of the setting. I, I could see it being done uh, very easily and being very immersive and engaging a lot of people. And then the discussions you can have afterwards are so great because you're not just you're not limited to just what the show showed, but what actually you explored. And so maybe you explored something that your friend didn't and you compare notes on the, on the story and it's like, Oh, you found that? I didn't, I didn't find that. How'd you do that? And then you can go back and experience it again. I would imagine like, uh, it's not Netflix, but the Disney, like you can imagine being able to explore the TVA or the end mm-hmm. of the end of time place, you know, at the end of the series, spoilers, uh, you know, or, or any, you know, it's the stuff like that, like, uh, you know, being able to just an open world, you know, where you could go mm-hmm. around and do things and there's stuff to do. I mean, there are a lot of open world sort of games out there already where it's, it's less about kind of following a path, uh, you know, to the final quest, but more just being in a world and experiencing it and, and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And there could be a narrative structure to that. I think that would be very interesting. It's like first generation uh, holodeck technology, basically. Yes, we yes. just want a holodeck. Yep. Net- so much Net- Star Trek in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Star Trek on the brain. <laughs> Before we move on, I have to point out, uh, I actually went to to college with the uh, guy who wrote this article the, oh. in Ars Technica. Yeah. Oh, he was, oh cool. Uh, he was on my floor in my dorm room, uh, played a lot of video games with him when we were, when we were in college together. Uh, awesome. Nice. That is fun. Small world. Uh, awesome. All right. So that does it for our headlines. Uh, let's move on to our picks of the week. Uh, why don't I go to you, Thomas? What is your pick this week? Okay. So my pick this week is a video transcoder. And if you don't know what a video transcoder is, it's basically just uh, a program that converts videos from one type to another. Mm-hmm. And uh, mine is called, it's called Handbrake. You can get it at handbrake.fr. It's an open source piece of software. Absolutely fantastic piece of software. Uh, it will allow you to, if you have a video that you need to compress down in size, or if you have a video that you need to convert to some other file type to be able to share with someone or to upload or just to watch on your, you know, maybe you don't have the right codecs on your system and you need to convert it to watch. Uh, this this program will handle a huge swath of what's out there and if if it doesn't you can probably find a library that will uh modify the program so that it will so it's called handbrake now what i've been using it for lately is um converting my dvds into usable uh format for my plex media player Mm -hmm. and um because i'm a complete junkie the way i am everything is on my box and i'm doing it all from the command line so everything's on my server i I have a (laughs) dvd drive in my server Mm -hmm. i just plug it in I run a command line uh, option on it, and boy, that has been an adventure learning all the command line options for (laughs) for (laughs) Handbrake. But but then that way I don't I don't take up any of my resources locally. Like my my computer is not tied up doing this. So my server, which is on twenty four seven, it will continue to do the conversion. And so I just loaded Handbrake up on there, and that's where I'm doing all the conversion from directly from DVD into uh, MP fours in most cases. I used Handbrake about 10 years ago, um, no, more than that, I guess. Uh, back when they had the video iPods, I ripped so many yes. DVDs <laughs> using that onto my iPod. Yes. <laughs> I, I did the, the Plex uh, DVD conversion a few years ago when I first got my Plex server set up. Uh, and the same thing, I had, I had a huge box of DVDs, and yeah, I don't want to have to have them taking up space, so I ripped them all and put them on my big hard drive and... Now I can watch the commitments whenever I want, or I don't know, uh, Star Wars even, I, although it's on Disney Plus. L- less reason to do that for some of these than there used to be. But yeah, Handbrake is a great program. It's a little bit, you got to figure things out a little bit. It's not the mm-hmm. most the, the most user-friendliest of all uh, um, interfaces. I mean, it's available for everything, Mac, Windows, Linux, and all that sort of stuff. But, right. mm-hmm. but there's plenty of tutorials out there, and it's been around forever. It's solid as a rock, so... Good. That's yeah. a good pick. It just works. It yes, really does. <laughs> it does. Great. Jack, what's your pick this week? So my pick is uh, kind of in line with what we were talking about in the last news article about immersive experiences. 
Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, me and my family went to the Vincent Van Gogh immersive experience. And what it is, is basically they have this gigantic room set up with a bunch of really uh, high definition projectors. And it goes through this whole immersive projection story of Vincent Van Gogh's life. And they do like animated versions of all his paintings and all these really cool effects. It covers all the walls. It covers the floor. It goes through his art style, the development of his art style. And it was it was really, really awesome. Um, they also mm. have a component of it where you use an Oculus Rift, and it takes you through, like, the village that he grew up in and through his life with um, with that. And you get to, like, look around and see, like, his room and, like, his painting style and all that stuff. Um, it was really, really a lot of fun. Um, it, it's a touring around in a bunch of different cities. If you have the opportunity to go, I would definitely say go. Um, my son, he's five years old. Uh, he absolutely loved it. So it's a really good thing for kids because it's a very hand-on way to experience art. Cool. Yeah, it's coming to Boston. I have to check it out. You uh, should be, definitely go. Be here in uh, September. Um, excellent. I've been seeing ads for it everywhere, but I wasn't sure about it. But uh, yeah, if you've seen it, I, I'm... He doesn't like Van Gogh. One of the greatest. Even the yeah. doctor loves him. Um, <laughs> so it's so a Doctor Who thing. It, it's a, one of the best <laughs> Doctor Who episodes. All right. Uh, great. Thank you, Jack. That's a good pick. So my pick is the new Siri remote for Apple TV. I I, I mentioned I was getting it a, uh, like a month ago now, and I've had plenty of time to use it. And let me tell you, <laughs> it is night and day from the old Apple TV remote. The old Apple TV remote, it's famously bad. Like, it's so funny. Apple has some great products, and then they have accessories that are terrible, like the the round mouse, where you have no way of knowing which way it's pointing, <laughs> you know, things like that. Well, the the original Apple, well, the, the, the most recent Apple TV remote was just terribly designed. It was, it was so symmetrical that you never could tell whether it was right side up or not when you're holding it in your hand without looking at it. And it was just it had all kinds of problems. The new one is great because it has actual buttons. Um, it has an on-off button, which is great because I can turn on the Apple TV and my TV at the same time with the on-off button, whereas with the old one, you had to press any button to turn the Apple TV on, and then had to, I had to use my other remote to turn on the TV. The one downside is that they've sort of rearranged some of the buttons, so like the the pause button is not exactly where my thumb expects it to be, so I'm often hitting what was it, the mute key, which doesn't really work with my TV anyway or my home theater, so it, it doesn't do anything, which is better than doing something wrong. Uh, uh, the, the, the Siri button is on the side, which is weird, and I, I do hit that once in a while, and it's kind of annoying. Um, I wish that were harder to hit. But in general, I love that the, it's got the click wheel sort of thing going on, like you had with the old iPods, and it feels very familiar. And the best improvement is the skip ahead button. You, you, you know, fast forward 10 seconds it actually works without like before you had to kind of very carefully place your finger on the glass trackpad portion and press it just right. This one is it. It's just a click of a button. So it is, it is much nicer and it feels, just feels better in the hand. I did get a case for it that has a lanyard in, in a, uh, it's a, uh, what do I call it? A holder. So I, I stuck it to a bookcase next to the TV and I, you know, it slides in there, and so it lives in the holder, which is nice. Uh, maybe I'll make that an, another pick in the in a future week. But um, nice. yeah, so the Apple Siri remote, well worth it. Even if you don't have a brand new Apple TV, it works on the older ones. I do have a question. Yes. So you're talking about the automations earlier. Have yes. you set it up so that when you start it, it like dims your lights and all that with the with the Siri remote? It could. Mm. I could do that. That'd be cool. Mm. Yeah. I There's would, your next automation. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know they have those the 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 Philips Hue lights that go behind the TV. You mm -hmm. know, maybe mm -hmm. it, like you know when that whenever whenever a, a Star Wars thing starts, it should like have the lights go. Yeah, that THX. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I'll have to think of some cool automations having to do with the Apple TV. That they're actually I've seen some out there. That would be fun. Nice. I'll, I'll think of that. Awesome. Uh, that should do it for us this time. So we'd love to hear from you. Anything we've talked about, any comments you have, we want to hear from you. By You can comment on the show at sqpn.com slash technology or at the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia, or send an email to technology at sqpn.com. We're also on Twitter where we're at sqpn. You can find us there as well. You can find links from our discussion and our picks of the week on our show notes at sqpn.com. 
be sure to write a review in Apple Podcasts. We've had a few uh, uh, reviews. We'd love to get more. It really helps a lot. So if you can write a review of the show at Apple Podcasts or any of the podcast directories, and then share the podcast with your friends. We, we think we've got a lot of helpful information here from a very particular viewpoint, and we think a lot of people would benefit from it, and we'd appreciate it if you'd help us to reach them. So until next time, Thomas and Herho, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. It's been great. Jack Barazzini, thank you as well. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest. <laughs>